I quote again, the words never again have never been able to protect future generations. It takes more than words, more than good resolutions, more than good intentions. These were the words of Simone Weil, a survivor of the Auschwitz death camp and later president of the European Parliament, speaking on the significance of the Holocaust to Europe in her speech during the commemoration ceremony in the German Bundestag. She said on January 27 in 2004, in the response to the terrible experience of the war of extermination waged by Germany grows the seed of uniting Europe. In this process of unification, Germany was able to earn the trust of former enemies and started to assume responsibility and in Europe and the world. In the early years, building Europe was mainly a reaction to World War II and the Holocaust was not explicitly mentioned. But this does not mean that it was on, not on the minds and the hearts of the founding fathers of Europe. Everybody involved knew that in order to build a peaceful Europe, it had to be united. Thus, uniting Europe was also a means to prevent the Holocaust in the future. Shimon Peres, the president of Israel, stated in his speech in 2010, which I mentioned earlier, we want to learn from the Europeans who unshackled Europe from a thousand years of war and bitterness and enabled Europe's young to substitute the hostility of their forefathers by brotherhood. It would be wise to learn from their experience to dream about a Middle East in which its countries will depart from the conflicts of their parents on behalf of the peace of their children. So when we look at Europe today, we have to remind ourselves that the European Union is not only the Euro. The Union is not only founded as a zone of integrated economic cooperation. On the contrary, it is founded on the deeper historical insight, never again should there be a war waged in Europe in the name of nation states. Never again should the people of Europe suffer from war and never again should a minority be prosecuted. Never again should a person live in fear because of his religion, heritage or background. And since it takes more than just insight, a body of European Union law was created, a common set of rules and binding regulations. All new member states have to adhere to this so-called acquis communautaire, making it the powerful transmission belt in building a peaceful Europe. To quote Ms. Weil again, it can hardly be esteemed what a moral victory it is that the accession of new member states of the former Eastern Bloc to the European Union today proceeds in peace as well as peacefully and democratically. And the latest example is Croatia. The European Union has brought the continent a prolonged period of peace and prosperity. The center of Europe has not seen war for more than 60 years. This is a unique achievement, a living unity in diversity to preserve this achievement is our common goal in Europe. This model of cooperation with endless rounds of negotiations is demanding. But to overcome the consequences of the model of the past, confrontation would, however, be even more demanding. Not less demanding on patience is negotiated under the roof of the United Nations. But it serves the main purpose on an even wider scale driven by the ambition to counter our militant world with structures fighting for the rule of law. The war tribunals of Nuremberg and Tokyo, as well as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, are powerful examples for this undertaking to prevent genocide and to defend human rights of each and every one of us. We all are aware that 
We only partially succeed, but the United Nations can be only so strong as its member states allows it to be. At the World Summit in September 2005, member states of the UN took an important step when they confirmed in the outcome document, I quote, each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. The international community, through the United Nations, also has the responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful means in accordance with Chapter 6 and 8 of the Charter of the United Nations." Unquote. In order to fulfill this responsibility, we also have to learn and understand the roots and terrible consequences of genocide. So it was adequate indeed that in the same year, the United Nations declared January 27 the International Day on Holocaust Remembrance, thus elevating this day to our joint commitment to human rights. This is also why to today we remember the Holocaust. In concluding, I would like to particularly address the young people in this audience. You might ask yourselves what this chapter of geographically as well as time-wise distant history has to do with you and with Singapore in the 21st century. You will, I am convinced, hear about this now. This is why I would like to express my appreciation and thanks to Professor Ko for his selection of today's distinguished speakers and their topics. I'm very much looking forward to listening to you. Thank you very much.